Welcome to Virtual Church. Welcome to our Virtual Church. Welcome to the Virtual Church. Welcome to the Virtual Church. Welcome to 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 Virtual Church. Well, good morning and God bless you all. Um, welcome to another virtual church with the Bridge Church uh, from Ayrshire in Scotland. Uh, thankful that you could join us today on the day when we begin our fast. So uh, we're looking forward to it. Um, my wife is here with me today. She's cheerleading me on. And we're just thankful for um, the ability to go into this fast to have one another encourage each other and uh, to have one another to, to help. It always gives us strength and uh, to walk through something with someone else. Two are better than one. Amen. So um, I hope that by this time um, we've chosen the fast that we're going to uh, uh, go, go, go on and um, Hopefully, you know, we've been quite specific about the fast that we've chosen. Uh, I've always found that if we become vague about what we're going to do, it becomes easier to go down alternative routes during the fast or even to give up completely. Um, and I'm just saying that from lots of experience. And uh, so it's good to choose what you're going to do. Everything in fasting works in together. Um, the type of fast, the duration of the fast, the reason for the fast, all of these things work together. And I believe that fasting successfully and concluding our fast is always possible if within ourselves we agree what we're going to do. So it's good not only to have maybe agreement with, like for example, my wife, because we live with one another, we have to be in harmony with, with each other, but I have to be agreed within myself what I'm going to do on this time of fasting and not forgetting the most important thing of, of all, of course, and that is praying. And it's the prayer and the devotional time that's created by the fast that produces fruit from the fast. Amen. So um, it's always good to have the right motives to fast. If we begin our fast with the wrong motives, it's really nothing more than voluntary self-deprivation and denial, denying ourselves. And that'll not be pleasing to us and it won't be pleasing to God and it will make it just so difficult to complete the fast. And so uh, I'd suggest today, take some time to read Isaiah chapter 58 and draw on that scripture to encourage uh, yourself as we enter the fast, you know, from verse 10 to 14, you'll read about God's promised benefits for those that fast to please him. And there's a clue in that there that we should remember that this time is not about being able to boast on how great the sacrifice is that we make. It's not about appearing or sh or, or, or being showy. Um, uh, to others about how spiritual we are or about how holy we are. Um, so it's not about that. It's, 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 it's about doing this unto the Lord. And so, uh, in fact, the word says that we should look after ourselves, keep ourselves clean and fresh, and others should not even be able to tell that you're fasting. Um, if anything, during this fast, you're going to look better than your normal self. Amen. And in Matthew chapter 6, uh, verse 17 to 19, it says, When you fast, 
wash your face and comb your hair, then your fasting won't be obvious. Instead, it will be obvious to your father who is with you in private. Your father sees what you do in private and he will reward you. So uh, get up, get clean, do all of that stuff, make yourself presentable. Um, we watched a funny little video in church a while back about the guy who made sure that everyone around him knew he was fasting and uh, everything was just such a drama. But uh, the Lord doesn't want us to be like that. He wants us to, to fast, keep clean. And in fact, we will look better during the fast. Amen. So we've chosen our fast now. We consecrate the fast. And so dedicate this fast to the Lord. Observe it as sacred. And I believe that he will see that and he will respond to the purposes of your fast when you consecrate the fast. And hopefully as we've prayed about it, and written down what we hope to achieve by committing to the fast, that it will be an acceptable fast. Amen. Um, and it will have a relevant purpose and it will be for such a time as this as well. So we, we can't go into this fast aimless. We, everything must have aims. So we go in with aims in mind. If you've already experienced the strong leading of the Holy Spirit, in this area, then great. Um, the choice on why you're going to fast and how to fast has already been shown to you, amen. So that's great if that's already been revealed to you. Um, but God will respond to our obedience to fast as he directs, amen. Um, obedience is always better than sacrifice. But don't worry, God sees what we lay down and give up anyway. So he does see what you lay down. He does see what you give up. He does see what you sacrifice. But the most important thing is obedience. And in Romans chapter 12, verse one, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Amen. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. You know, living a sacrificial life is what is acceptable to God, but the sacrifice always follows the choice to obey first. Amen. So um, we uh, may ask ourselves, well, why are we choosing to fast for the next 21 days? And there are lots of reasons for that. Um, the, your reasons may be different from mine. We'll have some corporate things as we pray and fast. You'll see things that will begin to come out and we'll communicate them to you as to things to pray for corporately. But are you fasting for the lives and the souls of those that, that you love, that you know, um, that don't yet know Jesus? Um, are you fasting because of a burden of compassion for other people? Um, is it because you're looking for the start of something new in your life? And the title of this message today is Behold, He Makes All Things New. Um, so are you looking for Him to establish something new in your life? Is it to reestablish a covenant relationship with the Lord and to put um, prodigal ways behind you? Um, is it for that? Is it just to know His will? and his guidance towards the first step you need to take for your future. Like we mentioned last week, first things first, you might be looking for that first step. Um, are you in need of uh, healing in your life, in your body? Are you in need of a miracle of some sort? Do you have a seemingly impossible situation that you've been struggling with, that you've been living with for some time? Or is there a dream inside you that um, has not been made possible, doesn't look like it might even become possible, but that he can make possible. Um, is it for that? Is it perhaps for a partner if you don't have one, if you don't have a beloved in your life? Is it perhaps for a partner or is it for a particular job or a career? So there's many things. Corporately, I would also say, you know, I, I, I will be praying and fasting for for, for people that have left, prodigals, people that have 
maybe forsaken their faith or have just drifted away for the return of people back into uh, the church, into his kingdom. So we've chosen our fast, we've consecrated our fast, and now we have to commit to the fast, which is where the rubber meets the road. Amen. And uh, our fast is going to be a statement of our faith in the Lord um, and that he is going to be able to sustain us for the next 21 days through the fast. And he will, I promise you, Garrett, uh, he will honour the, uh, the spiritual commitment you've made to the time of fasting. So, um, as I said at the start, it's always good to two are better than one. Um, because uh, we can hold one another up, bear one another up. But today, together, let's endeavour to go further and press in more than in times past. We fast at the beginning of every year, and uh, I sense that we can go more and achieve more this year. I've previously said things like, uh, or we've, you know, we've, people have said things like, don't worry if you break your fast, it's fine, just get back on it, get back up on, on your horse and go again. Um, well, we, we do know we have to deal with our flesh and the temptation to compromise, then we, we shouldn't be discouraged if we falter in our fast, but choose to see this year's fast through new eyes and keep reminding Let's keep reminding ourselves that God takes our spiritual commitments very seriously. And we will find that the rewards are great when we take these commitments seriously. The, the restoration power of God will begin to work in a new and a fresh way in our lives if we commit to our commitment. Amen. 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 If we commit to commitment. So... Uh, and sometimes you have to commit to the commitment to commit. It's, it can be never ending. But um, we can approach this fast in a new way this year if we choose to. So let's fast in expectation of new things being birthed out of the fast this year. And, so, and it's, so this is all about the new. And he makes all things new. Let's read the scripture in Isaiah chapter 43 verse 19. The word says, listen carefully. I am about to do a new thing. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will even put a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Some translations say streams in dry places. So different translations put it differently. But there's no doubt about it that the import of the scripture is that God makes a way where there doesn't seem to be a way and uh, he makes new ways possible and I think that's the thing that we have to grasp this year. What was that verse referring to? Well, that verse in context is reminding, uh, God's reminding his people of what he has already brought them through and he'd made a way through sands and sea for them he, they'd been th th on their wilderness wandering. They'd been through the Red Sea. They'd been many ways and he'd made a way for them. He would delivered them from the destruction of many armies, not least of which was the Egyptian army, a powerful, large army that pursued them. And uh, he's reminding them that he that they exist because he formed them for himself. Um, God created you and I for fellowship with him. He created us for himself. And so he's saying, you know, I've preserved you all this time so that you could stand in this day and give me praise. Um, I formed you so that you could declare my praise. Um, and I think that the, the Israelites had an inferiority complex. Now, if you read in 1 Samuel chapter 8 and you read through from verse 5, you'll see that they wanted a king. They wanted to be just like the nations around about them and have a king that would lead them in battle, fight their battles, lead them to victory, would judge their affairs, preside over them. And so they asked Samuel to get them a king. Of course, Samuel goes to the Lord and he says, this is what the people are looking for. And, and, and God was really displeased with, 
with what was going on because the people uh, just didn't want God, didn't want Jehovah to be involved in the process. They're just like that uh, obstinate child who, you know, when you tell them to sit down, they, they, they sit down, but they're standing up on the inside. There's just this, there was just this inherent rebellion in them. So although they had prophets and seers and they had Samuel there, they really didn't want God to be involved in the process. And so God consoles Samuel and he says, well, okay, so be it. Let them have what they want but warn them of the consequences of their choice, which Samuel, of course, does. And it would be great if you would go and read that. Um, the thing was, though, unfortunately, they didn't realize that the whole time, the entire time, through from generation to generation, that there was a process that was taking them out of the old and leading them towards a new thing. And the process had already begun long before they wanted to sideline God and do things their own way. Um, and it's the same today, I believe, that God is taking us through a process of leaving the old and entering the new. And God will send all manner of opportunities our way for us to either uh, receive or reject. So we, are, we all still live with this great freedom to have uh, to make a choice to, and to have choice and I want to read this um, scripture from Deuteronomy chapter 30 from verse 15 in the NIV and it says there see I set before you today life and prosperity death and destruction for I command you today to love the Lord your God to walk in obedience to him and to keep his commands decrees and laws then you will live an increase and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. Verse 17 says, But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Now choose life so that your children may live. That's very interesting scripture verse there. Choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God Listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. There's an astonishing verse there in verse 18. That one where it says, you will not live long in the land that you're crossing over into. And it speaks to me that it's possible to experience the new but it'll be short-lived for some people. And the new is there. The new exists. God already has the new. You can even taste it and see it. And it's, it hasn't been removed because God never turns his back on a promise. So he had a, a promised land for them. That new place was never removed. Um, but what this verse is speaking is that our enjoyment or their enjoyment of it would be shortened dependent on the choices that they made. And nothing has changed even until this day. Um, our enjoyment of the new things that God has for us can be uh, lengthened or shortened depending on the choices that we make. And just like making our choice regarding our fast, they chose their own way, which was not God's best for them. God did permit them a king, but it wasn't the king that he would have provided or would have chosen for them. Um, but it was a man called Saul who was chosen to satisfy the natural desires of the people, what, what they wanted, give them what they want. And just like Saul um, protested, if you read the word, that he was the least of his own tribe and his tribe, the Benjamites, were the least of all tribes. So the whole nation 
seem to have this inferiority complex. And God says, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, yes, you are as nothing um, amongst the other nations, but don't forget something. It was me, your king, that created Israel. It is me that gives life to you as a people. And I have a better future for you. I have a new destiny for you. And I'm asking you to change your focus. In other words, God is asking them, as he asks us today, to get a new focus. Don't focus on the insignificance and the obscurity of the past or the bondages of the past or wanting to be like those who surround you. But focus on where the Lord is taking us and what he will do in the future. And that's what he's saying to them. Focus on where I'm taking you and on what I will do for you in the future. You know, um, I love, there's a song about it, but there's a scripture too. I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. Child, you're mine. And so God is just, he has this way. It's one of his ways to call people out of the old and into the new, to call us out of old mindsets, out of old habits, and all of that kind of thing. And so let's ask ourselves, what is he calling you and I out of in this first month of the year? You know, um, perhaps for a lot of us, it's time to stop hitting the rock and to start speaking to it instead. You know, it's time to embrace more effective ways of serving the Lord. It's time to maybe address some of the things that we've left and we've neglected um, that all are all part of our faith, our giving, our, uh, our tithing, our offerings, our, our service, um, how, how we fulfill community together, uh, what we do in our own local community, everything. We, sometimes we just have to take stock of, 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 uh, of all of these different things. Um, s sometimes we have to stop relying on human wisdom and switch back to relying on that divine wisdom that only he can give. And I do know it's time to stop doing things in our own strength, 100%, and start to begin doing them in God's strength. Amen. So we are in times right now that when we must consider that the direction of our hearts, the direction of our hearts is always tilted towards heaven. Amen. Um, so is the, are our hearts tilted towards heaven or to earth? Are we still pursuing earthly things or have we increased our stake in heaven? Amen. Have we increased our stake in, he in heaven at all? Amen. Everything is subject to change in this life. Everything is subject to change. You just have to look around you and you know that. Um, but everything can be changed by just one thing. And that's by drawing close to the Holy Spirit. In Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6, it says, So he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, Not by might, nor by power, but, my, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. And I think we could go into this new year, for me personally, making the mistake of approaching it like other years where uh, trying to figure out things in my own understanding and, and press ahead under my own might and my own strength. But it's not by might nor by power, but it's by the Spirit of the Lord that we will achieve what we need to. Um, so as, as, as we think about, dwell on that, just remember that scripture, Zechariah 4, 6. And I want to move on now as we bring this to a close. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says here, and you'll all know this passage. So from now on, we regard no one from a human point of view according to worldly standards and values. Though we have known Christ from a human point of view, now we no longer know him in this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that is grafted in and joined to him by faith in him as our savior he is a new creature referring to you and i he is a new creature 
reborn and renewed by the Holy Spirit, the old things, and I think it's the Amplified here that says the old things, the previous moral and spiritual condition that we had have passed away and behold, new things have come. Because spiritual awakening, the, the waking up of our spirits brings new life. Amen. But all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ, making us acceptable to him and gave us the ministry of reconciliation so that by our example, we might bring others to him. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them, but canceling them. Amen. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. That is restoration, the restoring power that we spoke about earlier on, restoration to favor with God. Amen. All things are new. Amen. All things are new. All things become new. If you go back to verse 17, the things that become new were previously non-existent and they begin to be completely different and so far removed than, from what they ever were before. A new thing is a new thing. Amen. So these new things, there are new things that did not previously exist in our lives. Um, we can think about some new songs, new messages. Amen. Uh, new testimony, new revelations, a new, a new move of God and a move of God which is superior to what it succeeds. And so, you know, God always, when it's, it's a new thing, it's a new and a better thing, I believe. And just as the new heaven and the new earth will be vastly better than this one. Amen. We know that. So, but I always laugh because if there's one thing in the marketing world that we still hear to this day, it's that slogan of here's this thing and it's new and improved. All right. So it's a new and improved version of something that's been in the past. Of course, it is new and improved. They're always going to try and say it's new and improved because surely you don't want something old and stale and something that's dated. You want something that's new and improved, right? Well, you'd be amazed that that's exactly what we tend to try and do is to cling on to the old. And how many times have we said as we've come into a new year, well, out with the old and in with the new. Amen. Out with the old and in with the new. But then we fail to stick with the new and instead we cling to the old and familiar things. So, you know, I think think. Think back, how many of us didn't want to let go of Imperial and move over to metric? You know, how many people still wanted a Mars bar and a paper wrapper and still wanted a Snickers bar to be called a marathon? You know, there's just so many different things. I mean, you could, you could draw, write an endless list of things that came that were new and improved and people resisted the new coming in. But you see, God makes all things new. And there's a Greek word called kainos. And it means that, that the new is new in its quality. It's an innovation. It's innovative. It's fresh in its development and in its opportunities. Uh, and it's never been found like that before. That's the kind of new that we're talking about here. Kainos. Kainos. New in quality. Innovative. Fresh brings new opportunities. Amen. And Jesus gave us a parable that addressed perfectly the problems that we face when we try and mix the old and the new. We want to cling on to a bit of the old, but we also want a bit of the new. And that parable, of course, was the parable of the wineskins. And to sum that up, you could say you can't put new ideas into old mindsets and you can't get new results with old behaviors. Amen. And it amazes me the resistance that we put up to adopting the new things that God has ordained for us and we resist them. If you read in Luke chapter 5 from verse 27, um, it's, the, it's where Jesus um, is eating with the tax collectors and the sinners. And uh, it says there, Jesus calls leave uh, after this, pardon me, after this, after what? 
After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him, and Levi gets up, left everything, and follows him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. So you know this parable, you know this story well. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the religious people who belonged to their set, complained to his disciples, and why do ye eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And then Jesus is then questioned about fasting. So they say to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours go on eating and drinking. So like, what's the story here? Jesus answered, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and in those days they will fast. So he told them this parable, no one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch up an old one. Otherwise they will have torn the new garment, and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins and no one, drink, no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for they say the old is better. Oh, oh my, what, what was really going on there? Well, I believe that what was going on there was that Jesus was ushering in the new and the outcasts and all of those people that he was having a, a banquet with, they were not supposed to be a part of what was established religiously at that time. They, here we are, they're being given access to the new and coming kingdom by Jesus, the actual way maker of the covenant himself. I mean, that's amazing. They're being given access to the new. And of course, a lot of people didn't like that. And so a new, he was ushering in a new age, a new age of love, a new age of forgiveness. We're at the heart of what Jesus came to usher in. And in that parable, he's saying, listen, this new kingdom is, is not about exclusion. It's about inclusion. It's it's not for those, those who are sick uh, need a doctor, not those who are well. It's about those who, who, who are trapped in sin and in bondage to all different things. And more power to you if you are um, dealing with a habit or an addiction early this year. We're praying for you that you will overcome it in Jesus' name. So he's, not, he's saying that my kingdom is open and you're cleanliness and we all know what he what he called these pharisees at one point he called them whitewashed whitewashed sepulchers he says your your cleanliness comes from your relationship with god from the forgiveness that you have not from your external practices so the pharisees ask him about fasting as if to say you know why can't you just be like the rest of us now think back does that sound familiar why can't you just be like the rest of, of us? Doesn't that sound like the old mindset the Israelites had all along with regards to the other nations that surrounded them? You know, why can't we all just be the same, just like those around us? Well, here's the answer. Because God doesn't want you to be the same. He called you to be a new thing. He called you to a new thing. You are not of this world. We are not of this world. Jesus didn't come to, to see to it that wee bits of his kingdom and his teaching would somehow fit somewhere into our lives, like as if we'd give it space and stitch it in somewhere. No, Jesus came to bring something completely new and it needs to be taken as a whole. Amen. It's one or the other. If we mix one or if we mix one with the other, if we mix both together, 
will probably end up with a catastrophe or an explosion. Amen. So he, br he brought, he brings the whole kingdom and all of the benefits of it, all of heaven's resources, he brings it all so we can enjoy it all and have it all and live in it all. Amen. And so he, he says, it's got, you've got to match up. If it doesn't match, it's not going to be in harmony. So there's a, there's a Greek um, word, um, a Greek, the Greek for the phrase that will not match is a word called symphonio, which means to harmonize with, to be like-minded. And it's the root of the word that we use today, symphony. Amen. So Jesus is calling us to symphony, harmony with his kingdom. So Jesus' parable wasn't about the garment per se. It's about two worldviews that don't belong together and that could never work together. The old ways cannot mix with the new. So Luke finishes the story with Jesus making a comment that sounds like many people I have met. And that's the one that says, and no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for they say the old is better. You know, some people just can't let go of living in old ways. The old ways here were ways of blood sacrifices and other rituals, and they were made obsolete when Jesus died and paid the price with his own blood for our sins. So why would we still want to do that? And we do by trying to live up to some misunderstood standard of living and still trying to earn God's love or our way into his kingdom by sacrificial works and such like when all we really need to do is be willing to surrender ourselves completely to his mercy, um, to live under his grace, to receive his forgiveness, which is wonderful. And that's all we have to do. So we no longer have to sacrifice bulls and rams because Jesus paid the price. So when it talks about living in those old ways, it's talking about those old sacrifices. It's, Jesus is now the way, the truth, and the life. God doesn't want to patch up our old lives. We think sometimes, oh, God will patch me up. He'll just, he'll, he'll cobble me, me together again. But actually, he wants to give us brand new lives, brand new lifestyles. He wants us to live new lives in Christ. Amen. I hope that this message today has encouraged you. You'll go and study it out a little bit more. And so God bless you um, as you embark on your fast today. Pastor Linda and I are praying for you. And we're praying the best for you and your family, for strength through the fast, and that what you're fasting for, you will um, reap the fruits of that in due season. So we just say, uh, God bless you all in the name of Jesus. And until we're together again, um, God bless. We'll see you soon. Amen. Thanks for listening. Remember to visit our website, www.bridge-church.com and connect with us via Facebook and Twitter.